Hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah and um, I did my PhD here at um, U of T working on gene networks and uh, gene function prediction. So it's the stuff that I'm really familiar with. So feel free to ask any question that you might think is simple or if you think it's too complicated, I'm happy to discuss. I actually don't have too many slides, so I'm hoping that you guys will um, ask a lot of questions. So, so let's look at the learning objectives. Um, so the main idea is that um, we want you to get across the concepts of functional interaction networks, guilt by association, and, gene rec uh, and the concept of a gene recommender system, and then understand how um, you can use context-specific functional interaction networks, um, and also understand how direct interactions are different from label propagation and um, gene function, most of the gene function prediction algorithms. Um, and then if you kind of understand those conceptually, then you'll be able to use a gene recommender system like Gene Mania to answer questions like what do my genes do and which data is most relevant to answer questions about my gene sets um, and things like that. But we'll go through that in a more elaborate way. So um, here's the outline, which I'll skip. So um, just to uh, motivate some of the stuff that I'm going to tell you about, as you know, as biologists today, you have access to tons of different data sets. Uh, different assays, and this is really exciting because you can measure at very detailed genome-wide level um, various aspects of um, cells and their behavior. Um, so for instance, if you are interested in a list of genes that came up in an assay that you did, or you somehow know that they're correlated with some sort of phenotype, you can learn so much about what these genes do and how do they actually result in a phenotype of your interest in a very detailed and mechanistic way. And what I mean by that is uh, you can come up with a list of genes and look in public databases. In most cases, you don't even have to generate new data as long as you have some genes that you want to understand <laughs> what they do. You can look at public databases. For example, you can look at um, various gene expression um, data sets that are available widely to see what the temporal or tissue-specific pattern of expression of your genes of interest are. You can look at interaction databases like uh, genetic interaction data or protein interaction data to learn about their interacting partners. You can look at other proteins with similar domain composition to kind of figure out what are the molecular function of your genes of interest are. And you can look at pathway databases like MSIGDB or KEG or Reactum and, and these kind of databases to understand what pathways are your genes in. And all of that data is supposed to give you some clues to be able to say how does my gene of interest result in some sort of phenotype or cellular behavior that um, I might be interested in. So of course, you can do this manually, but this would be very pre-machine learning era, and I'm sure many people will still do this manually. <coughs> you do some assay, you come up with a list of genes, and then you go to all sorts of databases and start looking up what your genes do and what do they interact with. And actually, just uh, for my reference, how many people do these kind of um, things that I'm talking about, like come up with a list of genes and look at those genes in different databases. So I, I still do that routinely. And of course, you do that uh, initially when you start your research project a little bit manually, but eventually to make this more, more systematic, you want to do it in a comprehensive and a more systematic way, and that's what we're going to talk, talk about today. Um, so I would say if you were doing this manually, the downside, I mean, the, the upside would be that you have a lot of human intelligence that you can use to say this data is not relevant, that one is relevant, this is actually not telling me what I want, and I'm going to ignore this data. But so it's a process that um, requires a lot of your prior uh, knowledge and biases, but at the same time, um, your results are going to be biased to what um, you kind of had, had in mind about what your genes do. And also, it's not going to be very reproducible and um, re uh, applicable to another similar, similar analysis that you might do in the future. So we're going to talk about how are you going to make this process in a, in a much more systematic way. And to do this, there are approaches out there under the guise of gene recommender systems. So they're called gene recommender systems, and you'll get to know why um, this is actually an appropriate name for them, to try to do what I just said in a very systematic way. So to tell you about those, um, first I'll tell you about the concept of functional interaction networks. Uh, and that's because a really good way to understand what these um, gene recommender systems are doing is by really understanding what functional interaction networks are. So a functional interaction network is a network where the genes, uh, where the nodes are the genes, 
And the connection between them is some sort of similarity, and I'll elaborate on that in a second. But this similarity typically um, signals something to us about co-functionality between the genes. So if their two genes are uh, connected together with stronger links or stronger edges, that means they're somehow more similar, and that kind of implies that they're more likely to be co-functional. So another way to think about these networks is in terms of co-functionality -co networks, and some people actually call them co-functionality networks. So the very um, abstract representation of um, data in terms of networks of genes and their connections, and the, these connections are supposed to tell you something about the strength of co-functionality uh, between the connected genes. So the motivation from this actually comes uh, way 20 years ago. Uh, so how many of you have seen this paper or know about this paper, Eisen, uh, PNAS 98? So this is a very famous classic paper because it was first of many things. It was one of the first papers to use gene expression data and or generate gene expression data, and one of the first um, papers to actually propose um, clustering gene expression data, and also one of the first papers to show that by clustering gene expression data, you can gain insight about the function of unknown genes. So um, let me elaborate on that a little bit. So what they did in this paper is um, they generated gene expression data in yeast um, in multiple different conditions. So this is what their data looked like. So you have all your expressed genes on the rows. You have uh, several different conditions that they were investigating on the columns. And then they clustered um, this gene expression data set. And one prominent thing that they saw was this two kind of patterns that distinguish two sets of genes. So there you have sets of genes on top that um, kind of have this pattern of expression across all the, those conditions. And then there's a set of genes at the bottom that have a different pattern of expression. When they looked into this, they realized that the, the first set of genes are mostly genes that are involved in cell cycle, although there were some genes in that set that were unknown. And the set of genes in the bottom cluster were mostly genes that were involved in prote protein degradation. And then, the, again, there was some unknown genes in this mix. So another way to think of that whole thing is that if we use this data to draw some sort of network that connects genes based on their similarity and expression pattern across all these conditions, then the genes that have stronger connections are going to be the ones that are more likely to have the same function. So for example, the, some of the genes that were in here, part of the protein degradation complex, are here. And then I mentioned there's some unknown genes. So there's some here. And then there's another set of genes on top um, involved in cell cycle um, processes. So if you represent this data in this way, then you can start making inferences. And this is going to be very simple. And of course, it's more uh, sophisticated than this. But just to give you intuition, um, if you have some unknown genes here, then you can say probably this one is involved in protein degradation, and the one on top might be involved in some, some sort of cell cycle process. Um, does this make sense so far? Yeah. So, um, okay, so now I want to talk about a slight complication that I kind of overlooked, but it's going to become important later. So we have this gene expression matrix. I'm, I mentioned that we construct this network based on um, correlation and expression <laughs> pattern. Now, um, can some of you anticipate what the problem is? If you basically you want to construct these edges and you're measuring correlation uh, across um, the conditions for pairs of genes to come up with these edges. So what if some genes have negative correlation and positive correlation? So that, that's a good point. So it could be that some genes have positive correlation and some negative. It's not really obvious what to say about negatively correlated genes. Like this concept seems more naturally applied to um, genes that have positive correlation and expression. Um, also the size of the correlation, right? Like the what? size of the correlation matters. So, so one thing that's um, kind of important to keep in mind is when you are using these kind of data to build network based on correlation, it could be correlation across uh, an expression across a set of, um, certain conditions, correlation is never zero, right? Correlation is a kind of like, if you look at a, the histogram of correlation values that you could possibly get, it's basically uh, the histogram is centered at zero with some standard deviation. So when, when you see a nice network like this, that a gene is only connected to three other genes, that's not really realistic. Because in a, when you actually, if you actually computed networks from this data with the method that I mentioned, this gene would be connected to all the other genes. But then the weight of these edges will differ. So some of the genes are going to have much stronger connection. Some of them are going to have weaker connection. But it's not you're not going to see a nice sparse network like this. Um, and I'll just write that on the board, because maybe we'll come back to that later. So um, just to summarize what I said, you have this 
data, your gene expression data X, which has um, G rows, if G is the number of genes, and let's say C columns, if C is the number of conditions, um, so some notations that you might come back to, XIJ, are you guys familiar with network or matrix notation? Can someone tell me what XIJ is? The number of elements in the ith row in the J. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's um, the expression of gene I in condition J. So what I'm talking about taking correlation between two genes, what you're doing is that you're taking two rows of this matrix, so row I and row J, and you're computing the correlation between those. And you're doing for that for all pairs of genes in that network. And that's how you get a network that actually looks very dense in the beginning, but then you can use tricks. Well, that's not really complicated tricks, but what you do is you then um, set a threshold to say at, uh, below what um, edge strength you're not going to consider an edge on edge, basically. Uh, so there's ways to do that, and we can go over that if you guys are interested, but that's uh, basically one thing to keep in mind. So um, there are different types of functional interaction <laughs> network depending on what data type uh, we're talking about. And I should mention that this is a very gen generic concept. I, I mentioned how you construct a functional interaction network from gene expression data, but this could be applied to any other data that you measure. For example, it could be applied to protein domain data where you list the protein domains that a, a particular protein has. So then you can compute the correlation between two proteins, um, and that would tell you how similar they are in their domain composition. You can apply a similar concept based on like phylogeny and um, phylogeny information and um, other stuff. So um, now you can think of three different types of functional interaction network that could um, be potentially constructed. One, one is based on functional interaction networks that are actually based on data that already measures interactions between pairs of genes or pairs of proteins. And I'm going to use those interchangeably, genes and proteins. Hope you don't get confused by that. Um, so can some of you give me an example of a data that already measures networks as opposed to measuring kind of profiles like gene expression? Is that database. Or a data type that would measure um, edges, like in the in the representation that I mentioned. So you're kind of constructing that network based on your profiling data, but is there a data type that already measures edges as opposed to measuring something about the nodes in those networks? Any idea? So a protein interaction um, data set, like for example with yeast to hybrid or other techniques where you're pulling down a complex of proteins, then you're kind of by design, you are capturing multiple proteins together. So that directly tells you if there is an edge between them or not in that kind of representation. Versus with profiling data, you're computing, you're inferring those edges based on similarity in some sort of profiling that you have. So, that's, so, there, so there, there could be a direct um, interaction um, data that tells you directly about functional interaction between genes. And examples of those are protein-protein interaction, uh, data sets, and there's tons of data like that out there publicly available. There's also genetic interaction data um, where you are um, basically considering double knockouts um, across the whole genome and measuring if there is, um, you say there's a genetic interaction between two genes if the knockout of both of them is more than knockout of um, um, individual, basically put together. So, um, so those are for direct uh, interaction data set. You can have inferred functional interaction um, networks, and that's RNA gene expression um, data set is an example of data where you, you would use to infer functional interactions. Or you can have networks that combine multiple types of data, and probably it's obvious that networks that combine multiple types of data are going to be more powerful because you're kind of getting ready, read, rid of some of the noise that could be particularly observed in one data type and not the other. So you're kind of um, getting rid of low signal to noise ratio and hopefully enhancing interactions that are much more likely to be reproducible and reobservable across different systems. So, um, so in terms of uh, inferred interaction networks from multiple data sets, there are several resources that have put these together already. Um, so examples are SL networks. Um, string, which is really widely used. So how many of you have heard of string before? 
uh, only a few people. But so this is something that you can check out. It's a very popular tool um, that put together multiple types of data sets to construct these functional interaction networks. There's also um, things called human, warm, and et cetera nets. Um, there's biopic seep. Uh, these, all these, uh, the first category that I mentioned are examples of functional interaction network that are what we call our context um, independent. So there's just one giant network that somebody has constructed by thoughtfully putting data from multiple sources together, but they're not optimized in any way for the types of questions that you as an investigator might have. And I'll tell you in a little bit why that might be important. Then there are networks that we call context dependent. And these networks are basically networks that you put together from multiple data sets, but the way you put them together is very specific in terms of the function or the, the query or the function that you, or the gene sets that you want to analyze. Um, and you'll see um, how that is important and what that really means um, later too. When you say genetic interactions, I mean, for the important man, there's like the, you know, they interact with each other, yeah. based on physical interaction, genetic interactions, so genetic interactions actually, um, it's, um, have you heard of SGA? So the, um, there's a lot of, there's a set, large set of experiments that people do where you genetically knock out um, two genes at a time um, and look to see, like for example, people do this in yeast a lot. So you look in gross media to see if the knockout of two of the gene results in a more death compared to each individual um, gene. So in that way, you infer it's not actually a physical interaction, but somehow those genes are both working together in a, in a way that makes them essential together. Any more questions? Please feel free to ask questions. Otherwise, I'll try to go slowly. So <laughs> there's a lot of concepts in here. So, um, so, so the whole, um, this module is about predicting gene function. And there are two ways, um, computationally, you can approach that problem. The first way is you ask a question, um, like, what does my gene do? And here, what you can do is use what's called the guilt by association principle to predict what your gene does based on the connection that gene has with other genes and the function of those other genes. Um, you can also ask a question like, um, I give you some genes, give me more genes like this, and this is where the concept of recommender sister comes in. Um, and if you do this, then you kind of, as sub, sub question to this, you can already answer the first question. So the, the, the second type of answering the question, uh, the, what does my gene list do, is more powerful than the first approach. Um, and uh, you'll see that um, soon. So the first question that you actually might have is that why do we have to go through all of this to try to use all these data to predict gene function? Didn't someone already do this for me? For example, didn't someone already create the gene ontology database and already record what all the genes do? And I guess the answer is that not completely yet. Um, so there, there are databases like gene ontology and Panther, and I think there's a few other, and there's a few other species specific um, uh, ontologies that try to describe function of all the genes in the, in the organism, organism's genome. Um, but what you'll realize if you start dealing with these databases is that they're very incomplete. So for example, for um, human gene ontology, according to um, statistics from a few years ago, only had annotations, I would call informative annotation for 40% of the genes. So what does that mean is that often, if you look up your genes of interest in gene ontology, you do see something for them. But that annotation is very uninformative. It will be something like your gene is involved in immune function or it's in a, involved in a biological process, something that doesn't really give you any detail uh, about what exactly does your gene of interest do. So the whole idea of these um, gene recommender systems is to be able to use data that's becoming more and more abundant um, to answer questions about why you're what does your gene do based on connection of your genes to other genes, as can be inferred from all these large-scale data sets? Um, what's the focus there for, like, if you have, for example, one species, um, has really poor gene annotation. So I get a lot of kids, like, my top kids are always, like, I have no idea what they are, even the gene do. Yeah. So what's the focus there for that? Yeah. So I, I would say it's getting a look. So what's your species? Making them all up. Yeah. <laughs> 
So um, definitely some species are better than others. So some, some of these databases, for example, Gmania that we're gonna, gonna talk about, they're trying to, they're, they're trying to infer or transfer these kind of annotations to other um, species or organisms that are not as well studied. Um, but I would say that's very ongoing still, and it's, yeah, so there is not a huge amount of resources, although we're hoping that that will be better, because you have these kind of engines, you can apply the same type of principle. You don't need to have someone manually curating your databases. All you need to know is kind of, as long as you have some annotations, then you can infer the rest of the annotation based on connectivity and kind of network um, relationship between your genes of interest and other genes that maybe people know something about it. So that's the principle, uh, and that principle can be applied to any um, species. It's just that when people collect all of these data and put it on a database that, people, that other people can use, um, some species are more represented than others. So even if it's like in my, in my gene list, like reference zero, zero, one, not, you can just map it with everything else and see what it's clustered with. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about the first type of question that um, we could answer. The first qu type of question is, uh, what does my gene do? In a very simplified way, um, a gene recommender system would answer this question as follows. You basically, the gene recommender system will collect all sorts of public data, uh, for example, public gene expression data, protein-protein interaction data, protein domain composition, convert all of these data into a static network that basically links genes together based on the similarity of those genes across all these different data sets. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then once you have such a giant network that's built based on multiple data sets, you can look up your genome interest. Let's say your genome interest is CDC42. Um, you can look what other genes are linked to your genome interest in this giant network that's been um, compiled. So if you, basically you have your gene here, you know what other genes it connects to, then you can do functional enrichment analysis to see what functions are enriched in this sub-network that you extracted based on your gene of interest. And in this case, uh, so the direct neighbors of these genes are some of the genes that are here, and this sub-network is enriched in polarized growth, cellular bud, small GTKs regulatory activity. So based on knowing what the network uh, neighbors of these genes, we can kind of infer what the core functionality might be based on what we know about other genes that it connects to. So um, is, that, does that, uh, is that obvious to everybody? Or do you guys have questions about that? Because I see some faces that kind of look surprised. So um, is there something that I can clarify? So is this guys? the same as gene prioritization? It is the same. So it's the same concept. Is the systems that you use, are they the same as like Amazon recommends you books when you go on? Exactly, based yeah. On your yeah, so, so we'll get to, that, to exactly that, but it's the same idea, it's the same concept. So let me talk a little bit about how do we, so I mentioned all you need to do is to go to one of these recommender systems with your genome of interest, and they've already kind of done everything else. They've collected those data, they've constructed the network, and now when you go in with your gene, all, all they have to do is figure out what other genes are linked to your gene, and then do an enrichment analysis on, on the set of linked genes. So let me tell you how they actually combine um, these data in a little bit more detail. So, and I don't know, you guys probably can't see the boards if I write over there, is that right? You can't see it. Um, okay, so that's fine, I'll just describe what hap what's, what's happening. So um, each of these data sets, so in this example, we have three data set, a gene expression data, a protein point interaction data, and a protein domain data set. So for each of these data, you build a network between genes, and you have an edge between each pair of genes. You threshold that net network somehow. So for example, you say, I'm going to only consider um, edge weights that are in the 10 percentile, based on their, um, how, how large they are. Um, you do that for each of those uh, data sets separately. So you have three networks. And then you have to add them up. And then the process of adding them up um, it kind of distinguishes different approaches that you have. Simplest thing that you can do is just simply add the edges that you saw for each pair of genes. So gene A and gene B had a weight, uh, edge weight of 0.5 in the first data, 0.7 in the second data, and 0.8 in the third data. Then you just add all those numbers to get 
uh, edgeway that represents all those different uh, network functional interaction networks that you've constructed. Um, so once you have that, then you look at um, CD, CDC42 and what genes, what genes it's linked to, and then again you have as long as the edges uh, between the genes that it's linked to is above some threshold, you can draw that as a network for that um, query gene. So we call this a query gene. And then you can, of course, do functional enrichment analysis um, on that. Is that, um, is that clear? Any, no questions? So one question, one important question that was brought up is, what do you do with negative edges? Most people just ignore <laughs> negative edges because um, if you actually test these kind of system to see how well they can predict function of genes that you know in a cross-validation setting where you kind of pretend you don't know their function and try to predict the function of some of the genes, um, you'll see that if you include negative edges, you're not gaining that much. So um, that's the rationale people use to just use, ignore any negative edges. Um, initially, what people uh, were doing were just take the absolute value of negative edges because maybe they're um, still related to each other. It's just um, um, negative edges. You just treat them as some sort of relationship, so you take the absolute value. But um, that turns out that it doesn't. It's not really helpful in terms of predicting gene function. So I would say most approaches now um, don't consider them. Um, and then in terms of so once you have this network, then you can do functional enrichment analysis. And have you guys seen? Uh, functional enrichment analysis. I think it was one of your modules, so um, you've probably seen it. So what actually happens is that, uh, for example, this system, um, in this gene recommender system, they've already downloaded all gene ontology annotations, and they go through each one and do an enrichment test, um, and then they report the functions or go annotations that pass um, p-value threshold. That's why you get multiple kind of function that could be significant. And the, um, the protein interaction network is standard, like if you're looking at human data. Yes, okay. that's a very good question. None of these things are static. <laughs> so um, protein interactions depend on which tissue, which system, which technology. Um, it, it depends on many things. Of course, there are going to be some edges that are always stable, like with the complexes that are, for example, cell cycle um, complex. They're all always going to be connected together in most data that you would measure. But there's a lot of variation from data to data. And um, what people, like informatics or, or, or computational people, try to do for these kind of systems is to include as much data as possible. And in that way, you're hoping that by adding the data together, you're kind of averaging out the noise and you're enhancing um, interactions that are stable across multiple data types. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. None of these data are stable in the sense that it's not the truth. But together, hopefully, they're telling you something uh, that could be helpful in, in terms of understanding what kind of other genes your gene of interest interacts with. So, um, so what I mentioned just now with this um, gene recommender system that you saw in the previous slide is a context independent gene recommender system. And that's why I went through the example to tell you how you would add these networks together. Simplest way to add them together is just we call uniform weighting, which is basically each data contributes equally to the final edge, which is just the sum of all the edges that you observe for a pair of genes. So, um, you can do that in, in a slightly different way, but I would say uniform weight, uniformly weighting different data is probably one of the widely used approaches um, that people do for this. The other approach you can take is, um, um, is to construct a context-dependent context network. And there are only a handful of um, approaches that take this, um, handful of methods that take this approach. That includes uh, G-mania and the map, it's hard to say. Um, I'll tell you about G-mania and how this is done. So here's the intuition uh, behind it. So let's say that you're interested in um, P53 protein. Um, and if you ask me what does P53 do, um, you could mean many different things by that. Um, you could be asking about the biological process that it's involved in. Um, you could be asking about the biochemical or molecular function it's involved in. 
Um, you could be asking about where does it um, localize to, so sub-cell localization. You could be asking about its regulatory targets, or you might even be interested in which, uh, what's its temporal expression pattern. So depending on what you have in mind, that question might mean many different things if you just ask me, what does my gene do? And um, ideally, if the algorithm could figure out which of these you're interested in, you don't have to really specify that's exactly what I want, but hopefully there could be an algorithm that can guess which of these is the, uh, of most interest to you. And this is the goal of gene recommender system that construct context um, dependent um, networks. So um, yeah, so we're going to talk about that. Um, and here is um, going back to someone asked a question about um, uh, like recommender systems, general recommender system like Amazon. Let's say that um, you are interested in learning about different cities, and you just told me that you're interested in Memphis. Well, if you had given me Memphis, Knoxville, Nashville, uh, what I would tell you, what I would recommend to you, would be very different than if you told me Memphis, Alexandria, or Cairo. So the context that you put your query in really determines uh, what you really mean by that query. So in the first case, um, you're just interested in cities in the US, Whereas in the second case, you're interested in ancient cities. And if you just told me Memphis, there's no way I could have known um, which of those kind of uh, intentions you had in mind. But if you give me a little bit more, you don't even have to tell me what you want. Just give me a few more examples of what you have in mind. Then I, I'm, I, I, will tr I will try to figure out what to do. And computers are really good at trying to figure out the pattern. So if you give it these two lists, they can figure out um, exactly what you had in mind and recommend other cities. And so actually a few years ago, this is probably 10 years ago, there was, so, there was something called Google Sets. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of, it, heard of it. It doesn't exist anymore. But it was exactly a recommender system like this. And it was uh, motivation behind some of the Gene Mania work. Uh, and how it worked was that it basically had five to 10 boxes. And you would put anything that you want in those five boxes. So you could put like five cities or five types of cars or five mountain names or whatever. And it would try to guess what other thing you could be interested in. So if you put these three cities on top, it will guess other cities for you. Um, and that's exactly the idea of a gene recommender system that um, we'll talk about. So, um, so the idea is that instead of just trying to predict, trying to say, what does my specific gene do, we can say, give me more genes like this. And in the process of doing that, then you can actually understand what is the function of um, your gene of interest. So um, this is um, what Gene Mania does. Um, the, this part is the same. So you have your database uh, functional interaction networks that have been already pre-computed. Then instead of providing one gene, you provide a list of genes. Um, and it gives you a network back and an enrichment of those, um, functional enrichment of genes in that network back. And we'll talk about each component of this. Um, but the basic idea is that um, now, by giving it Gmania a list of um, genes, I'm trying to figure out which of these network databases best fits what you had intended about uh, what you wanted to know about this um, gene list. So um, just to recap, so. Um, Gmania is one of these gene recommender systems that uses um, context-dependent network. It has three components. So the first component is um, deriving a common representation for all sorts of data that already exists out there. And in the common representation, we're talking about these functional interaction networks that I mentioned. So uh, in the data in the Gmania database, you have let's say D data sets that you've downloaded, and you represent each of those as a network. So you have D networks that are already computed. Then in the second step, you construct a comp what we call a composite or um, combined network that's a weighted combination of those original D networks that you had. And then in the third step, you use this network to come up with um, predicted function for the list of genes that you provided. So um, let's go through the steps of this. And to do this, we're going to go um, live demo, um, muscle contraction in the heart, and so on. So let's see. So we're going to take this gene set. And this is Gmania website, so gmania.org. And you're going to go through actually examples in your lab. You're going to go through it. So I uh, don't have to worry about um, kind of following every step. 
So I just pasted uh, my list of genes here, and then if I run the GeneMania query, I get this network. Um, but first, let, let me mention this, that you see this um, little uh, icon on the top where my pointer is? So that's a human, uh, but you can select different organisms here. So depending on the organism that you select, you might see different things, but hopefully not too different for, for processes that are conserved. So um, there's Arabidopsis, uh, C. elegans, um, Drosophila, E. coli, human, mouse, rat, um, and yeast that you can see on this list. So what I did was I just um, pressed this search, and Gmania gave me this network. And now as part of this network, let me try to make it a little bit bigger. So, um, okay, so a few things. So what you see is uh, the edges between genes. Some are much thicker than the others, and that's basically because some of the functional interactions are um, stronger than others. Um, and the other thing that you might notice is that they have different colors. Um, so what that means is that the, um, depending on which data set actually told you about that edge, um, you color them differently. For example, co-expression data is in pink or in purple. So this is, this is a link that's inferred based on gene expression data. Um, this um, this uh, kind of like uh, green, blue one is based on pathway databases. You can see it uh, up there. So there, you have different types of edges that connect your gene sets together. And um, that you can get all that information um, up on the top. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is, um, so there is a component that, so you, you inputted a list of genes, and I, I don't know how, I don't remember how many genes were in that set, but uh, I think about, let's see, um, 17 genes uh, on your list, um, but there's more genes than 17 displayed here. And the reason for that is that, remember this is a gene recommender system, so you gave it some genes, it, gave, it gives you the connection between genes and some additional genes that are connected to your set of query genes. So the one that you inputted originally are the ones that have these um, horizontal lines, um, a vertical line going through them, and the genes that was predicted to be kind of like part of, should be part of your uh, investigation are, are genes that are solid, that are like solid um, black. Um, the, now that you have this network of genes, so you can specify how many genes you want um, Gmania to predict along with your um, query genes. So um, we started with 17. I think by default, Gmania provides 20 additional genes. So there should be something like 37 genes here. Um, what you can do is you can do functional enrichment analysis, and that's at the bottom here. So you can uh, go through Gmania's already gone through um, enrichment testing for all gene ontology um, annotations and different hierarchies and um, ranked the different annotations based on um, their p-value. So for example, at top you see circulatory system uh, processes. Like I said, some of these are um, muscle, um, genes that are important for muscle uh, contraction, and um, that's why they show up here. So heat, uh, heart, heart contraction. So what you can do is you can click the ones that um, are of interest to you, and it will color the nodes um, based on um, those annotations. So for example, this gene here in the middle, it's now has uh, multiple colors, and that's um, because it's annotated with those uh, multiple functions on this list here. And I should mention that in this list, um, only um, gene ontology annotations that pass a certain significant threshold based on um, multiple testing are actually displayed. Not, not all the functions are displayed, only the ones that are significant. Um, you might have mentioned um, the size of the node, we'll come to that in a second, but it's how central that node is in so the how many, entire, how many yeah. neighbors it has? How many, not exactly direct neighbors, but because um, we'll see that concept in a second, but overall how connected it is through the network. So the, one, the ones that are more central hopefully are more like larger than the ones that are kind of more peripheral. Also, one other thing, um, so this gene list that you put in, like, what would be an example of a gene list? Like, yeah. Great question. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a, in a second, but I wanted to see if, uh, what was your question? I just wondered, like, 
You just inputted some genes, and I was wondering where, like, what kind of database was pulling that from the student What kind of, what, where did I get that list? Yeah, yeah. like, how do Okay, you so know? what's the use case? Yeah, so that's a great question. So what this is really good for is you do a screen, and you come up with a list of genes. Um, I don't know, for example, you're interested in um, what's different between um, stress condition A and stress condition B. So you do um, however, whatever data, whatever data you're generating, and you come up with a list of genes that are different. And that's the ideal use case, that you already did, did some analysis, you came up with a list of genes that are different between two conditions or multiple conditions that you were investigating, and now you want to understand why did you observe? Like, how, how does this gene together, gene set together, make sense? Um, and so this is the tool to try to see what other genes the, this gene set connects to, and based on that, you can try to understand what is the cellular context of observing this set of genes. Obviously, you don't have to have multiple genes. You can use it with one gene, and we can talk about that later as well, but this is a case where you've done a screen and you have a list that came up on top of your analysis. And then with... So going back to like GSCA, um, would the rank matter, or do we the order of the genes we put? No, no it, it does not. So that's that's very different um, compared to GSCA. So when you're doing um, pathway analysis with GSCA, uh, you are um, essentially you kind of ranking the genes in a way that allows you to do the enrichment. With this, you just treat your list as these are my genes, and it internally will come back to that. It will try to try to figure out which one is more important than the other, but there's no, you don't have to provide any kind of ranking or any kind of sort. And you start with like, let's say 10 genes, and what you see in the graph actually adds more genes to that? Yeah, exactly. So it's the same concept that I mentioned in the previous slide that you had those cities. So like you provide some cities, it gives you more cities. So here you give, it's a functionality that you can disable or not disable, and I think you might be going through some of that in your um, module. But you can say, I want to see additional genes, or you might say, I don't want to see any additional genes. You can only look at your own gene set and try to understand how they connect to each other and what their function is, or you can get additional gene set. I would say getting additional gene set is usually works because uh, your, your gene set is subject to some noise. Um, so to define your gene set, you have to set some sort of threshold. Um, and then you come up with a list. But obviously that's not, probably that's not complete, and the way you set your threshold um, may or not, may not be very robust. So uh, if you try to predict additional genes, it just tries to pull in other genes that are highly linked to your gene so that it gives it more context for trying to figure out what the function of all those genes are. But what you see here in this example is this gene list that you get, or it's... Additional, so, it, it, so I gave it 17 genes. And it's, it gave me, I think by default, it's 20 additional genes. So it should be. Okay, a ton of difference. Which, uh, which is uh, so you'll go through that in your exercise, but there is. Um, oh, how can you tell the difference? So some of them are striped. Oh, okay. Like Sorry. some of them, there's a stripe going through them, and some of them are solid. Sorry, this is kind of. Yes. Yeah. So each specificity is factored into that, because sometimes. Genes are expressing the tissue and also expressing yes. the other. So, so in a way, so we're going to come back to that, and that's so that's the great question. The the whole concept is that you can have context independent networks which they don't care about tissue specificity. So genes are connected if they were correlated somehow somewhere. It doesn't tell anything about the tissue that you might be interested in. Uh, and then there's context dependent network that tries to understand the context that you're asking about that. And that could have, those networks could have um, some specificity that might correspond to tissue specificity. And maybe if I, once we explain that concept, then it becomes a little bit more clear. But it's not, tissue specificity is not something that you directly um, build into it. It's by design, hopefully the algorithm is actually finding the right tissue context. And, and I have another question. So, and how does it, Cancer is one of the most researched topics and if you look at the citations, how that is weighed into the... Yeah, yeah. So um, that's another really good point. So there's some genes that are much more studied than others, and that could create some biases. So you might end up finding all the genes are always like well studied because they link to everything. Um, I would say that's a problem. That's not 
conceptually, that's not such a big issue for these kind of gene recommender systems because they're doing an unbiased screen. You remember that we're not, most of the data that goes into it is, for example, from a gene expression study, for multiple gene expression studies, because those are the most abundant type of data. And in gene expression studies, um, you're measuring everything all at once. So there's no literature bias that's creeped into your gene expression data yet. Um, literature bias comes into once you take into literature networks and pathway databases and things like that. But if you're just talking about networks that are built from a genome-wide data set, there is no um, bias that is in that data before aggregating it with other um, literature knowledge. Does that make sense? Um, so there's also, I would say that there's a lot of research in this area of um, literature bias and multifunctionality. And what you see, I guess, depending on how you, how, like what you care about. If you care about your mostly connect, your, your gene of interest and what are the top genes connected to that, Typically, you're not going to be you're not going to be hurt by um, what they call multifunctionality of literature bias. But once you go into um, evaluating your method, um, what, what's, what's an evaluation metric called uh, receiver under uh, operating or rock curves, where basically you try to recall as many genes as possible, then um, literature bias is important in terms of figuring in, in terms of evaluating or comparing different methods. To each other, but I would say for your specific gene list, if you're using genome-wide data, that's really typically not a big issue. Yes. When you generate your gene list, you should take the later approach to generate them. Let's say for differential expression studies, do you only, for example, take genes that are upregulated, or you can combine them? With you can combine. So yeah. So in ideal case, how? So let's say that you have a list of genes that might be representing multiple processes, right? So some of them are positively correlated with each other, and those are upregulated, some of them are negatively correlated. In an ideal case, what should happen is that you would have, um, like the figure that I showed at the beginning of the slide, you would have two sub subnetworks. So all your positively correlated genes are in one network, and your negatively correlated genes are in another, and then you have different functions that are enriched in these two subnetworks. That, like in theory, that would be that ideal, what would happen, but uh, data is never perfect, so probably what you see is um, kind of um, two networks that are a little bit separated, but there are also some connections, weaker connections between them. Um, another thing that could happen is that your list of genes are just have nothing to do with, with each other. And what should happen in an ideal case is that you will get like a blank network. Nothing is connected to anything in that case. And those are always really good nulls to test to make sure that actually you get the expected behavior when you shouldn't see anything don't, and it's not like you're always seeing interactions between genes. Was there more questions? Yes. Um, so, okay, so you do a differential gene expression test, and you get a list that is different from one condition to another, and you put it in this, and then it adds genes. Um, but then these genes that it's adding into your network are not differentially expressed, because obviously not, yes. it didn't pass through yeah. the threshold. Yeah. So then, what do you infer? For, like, what is this adding to my knowledge then? It's trying to use other genes to better understand what your genes are. Okay, but it's not telling me what networks or what pathways are going to be different between the two conditions. It is because in your assay, in your analysis, maybe those genes didn't come up. But if they're very tightly correlated with your genes, it could be that. I mean, experiments are not perfect, right? If you repeat an experiment again, you might get. Hopefully you get similar set of genes, but you're not going to get the exactly same results. Um, so in a way, it could be that those genes could have come up um, if you repeated your experience. So that's one interpretation. Another interpretation could be that, well, they didn't come up, but they're actually linked to an important, like um, maybe pathway A is really um, is coming up in your analysis, but that is tightly linked to pathway B. And if you want to understand the context of that pathway or figure out what experiments to do next, you might want to know that there's another path or another gene set that are highly correlated with your genes of interest. So it's a way to basically give you more context to think about what your genes are and, and how they interact with other genes in, in, uh, in the cellular system. Yes? 
So kind of showed you this picture, but this is just on the slide now. So you had your input genes, and uh, maybe you can see it a little bit better now. So this additional genes that came up are these solid ones, and then your, your genes are your gene that you actually input have the stretch through them. And again, I'll emphasize, uh, you probably see this later too, that you can specify if you, how many other genes you want to see, if, if any at all. So you don't have to see any genes if you don't want to. It's just, if you see them, if I give you more context, you think about your, your genes that you input it. So, um, yeah, so in G-mania, there's um, multiple um, kind of different functionality that you can use. Um, so you see the three dotted line on top, and let's go to the website. So if you click on here, um, you'll see basically the list of all the available networks that could be used with the G-mania analysis. So um, you have co-expression networks, so if you open this up, you'll see there's hundreds of gene expression data sets that have gone into this database. So you see these are the names of the different uh, publications. So what Gmania does is scrapes all of GEO and all sorts of public repositories for all, all different data sets that people have generated since 20 years ago and tries to put them together. And that's where the power is. You don't have to worry about where the data is coming from. Hopefully by aggregating all of these data, we're canceling out the noise and kind of just capturing um, interactions that are kind of consistent between all these different data. So um, for example, you can uh, click on the name of a data set and it will take you to the, there's a link to geo where that data um, is available. So what you can see here is that you have all these different um, quirks and these are just under the co-expression category. You have other um, categories here, co-localization, genetic interaction, paid pathway databases. So as a user, you have a lot of freedom, which sometimes is nice, but sometimes is scary. Uh, <laughs> there's too many options. But what you can do is, you can see you can click which data you actually want to use. So if you don't want to use any pathway databases, you don't have to. You can unclick that. Um, you can use or don't use a co-expression data set. And there's, but there's default um, kind of parameters that I'll tell you about. And even within co-expression data, you can select very specific data that you want to use and only use those. And it's always good to try multiple approaches to make sure your results are not just dependent on a very particular um, setting. The other thing that you can do is you can upload your own network, and you can see the link here. If you don't want to use any of these data that's out there, you just want to visualize your own data in terms of network, you can upload that and look at it here. Um, what else did I want to tell you? All right, so, and then the last thing that I'll mention is that there's, uh, at the bottom, there's um, customized um, uh, kind of um, parameters that you can set. So this link on top, um, it says max resultant gene. That, so that's the parameter that I've been talking about. So right now it's set to 20. That means that 20 additional genes will be reported, but you have the freedom to say, um, so you can basically set this to zero. And if you do that, no additional genes will be reported. Um, and so now we get to this um, network context dependent networks, which kind of partially answers a tissue specificity question as well. So uh, let me go back to the slides.
So uh, to recap, so Context Independent Network is a network that basically collected all of these data. You take a weighted sum. So the edges in this final combined network is the weighted or the sum of all the edges that you saw between pairs of genes. And that's a context-independent network. I mentioned string, for example, used as a context-independent network. So these networks have no information about tissue specificity or the context of your query. Now, you can imagine using a context-dependent network. And what it would look like is that instead of just simply taking the sum of all these networks, you take a weighted sum. So some of the networks could be given a, a really high weight, and some of them could be given a zero weight. So you're not using information in those networks at all. Um, so um, how do we set? So, so and, and the, the way you would do this um, mathematically is pretty simple. You multiply, you have this uh, scalar, wi for network i, that you multiply all those uh, edges in network i with the weight wi, and then you add up across all the different networks. So if your network D had a weight of 0, none of the edges from that network would contribute to your final combined network edges. And that's only sums up as the, thick, uh, as the width of yeah, the edge? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So uh, maybe let me write this on the board, and maybe I'll write it right so everyone can see it. So let's say uh, your final network, um, call it W, the edge between node i and j is going to be wij. So wij, uh, and I'm going to put a star here because this is your combined network edge between i and j. That's just going to be a sum of, and now I'm going to change notation a little bit. So um, the weight, uh, so, so for network 1, we're going to assign it a weight of alpha 1, and we have wij from network 1. And then if you have D networks, we have D of these weights uh, that we assign to the different networks. And then we actually have the edge between I and J in that network. So the final um, network edge, I'll write it here too. Um, you guys can, can you guys see over there too? Can you guys see it? Um, so the final network edge is just a weighted sum of the corresponding edges from all these different networks. And now you're free to, to, to figure out how to weigh the different networks. And that's where the context-dependent networks um, comes in. So algorithmically, how would you do this? And to do this, there are two um, overarching um, goals. One is to take account of the relevance of the network. And one is to reduce redundancy. So let me first talk about redundancy. Um, so I, when I pulled down that co-expression data in Gmania, you saw that there was hundreds of um, co-expression networks that were in there. So if you, so some networks are just a lot more abundant. Some network types are a lot more abundant than others. Um, and if you, if you don't consider that, your basic results are going to be swamped uh, by those data types that are very, very abundant. Um, so uh, for example, we have hundreds of gene expression data, but probably two protein-protein interaction networks or something like that. Um, and if you don't take into account enough, if you just simply add up all the edges, then obviously we're going to be over-representing information that comes from gene expression data. So we want to take account of redundancy, and that's one component. The other is that we want to um, find networks that are relevant to a particular query. And here, where uh, it comes uh, very useful if you have a list of genes as opposed to one gene. Because if you have a list of genes, you can assess how relevant each of the networks are to the, your list of genes. And um, let me tell you right now how this happens. So let's say that you have four types of networks in your database. You have a network based, based on cool complex data, a uh, network based on shared phenotype data, um, network based on genetic interaction data and a network based on gene expression data, which we call co-expression network. So what happens here is you basically you have this network importance weight for each of those um, networks, and then you add up the edges to come up with this composite network. And then the edges of this composite network is a weighted sum of the corresponding edges that you saw throughout your um, database. So how, how do you do this? Um, I want to talk about how do you actually assign these network weights? 
And I'll give you the high level intuition. I'm hoping that you'll ask me questions to kind of probe a little bit more. But the intuition is that, let's say that you have your input gene list. I'm going to construct what I call an ideal network from that, from your gene list. So in the ideal network, your, the genes on your list are all connected to each other, and they're not connected to any other gene, just they have a lot of connections within themselves. Then you would want to figure out how to construct a linear combination of these underlying network so that you're enhanced, you're reproducing that ideal network. So if you try to do that, then you will try to find networks where your gene sets are much more connected to each other than um, genes that are not in your set. So mathematically, there are, there are ways you can formulate that, and actually that's pretty simple to, to basically figure out how to construct a weighted combination of these underlying network so that the connections between the list of input genes or your query genes are um, maximized. So, so maximize the connection under your um, gene list. Is that, um, is that people, have, do people have questions about that? So what's, why that's um, nice, because now you can, based on your query, you might completely ignore some data uh, and use others. Um, let's say, for example, your list of genes of interest or your query genes are genes from um, that are involved in brain processes. Uh, and most of your gene expression data are coming from, um, let's say, blood data, where these genes are not even expressed. So hopefully, this automatic weighing approach is going to figure out that your genes are never present in co-expression networks that are built based on blood, and it's just going to ignore those <coughs> and give more weight to co-expression data that's based on data from um, brain. Although this is not enforced, you don't say that, fine, brain tissue for me, but by, by virtue of providing your gene list that have information inside them about um, these genes that are hopefully co-express in the brain, you end up, the algorithm ends up selecting data sets that are relevant. So, um, so in G-mania, um, there are, so if you go to the, where the three dots are, uh, it'll give you an option of network wait, waiting. So there's different approaches you can take to um, combine all these different networks that exist in the G-mania database. So this, you can do uh, what's called automatically selected weighing method. And that's probably the default that you would do. If you select automatically weigh, weighted, uh, automatically selected weighing method, what it does is that if your query, so if query is a list of genes, if your list of genes has more than six genes on it, it will try to automatically figure out which network should be used. So it does a context-dependent network that I mentioned as long as you have more than six genes. But if you have less than six genes, there's just not enough information to do that. Um, and if, if that scenario holds, then it'll try to, it'll use uh, one of the default uh, weighing methods. And the default weighing method is um, biological process uh, weighing based, weighting based. Uh, and I'll mention what that is in a second. But um, I also want to mention that there's this equal weighing option that if you actually don't um, want to use automatic weighing, you can just say um, weigh all the networks equally or all um, networks by data type equally. So the difference is that if some of the some of the data types have many more networks than others, as I mentioned, coex gene expression data have a lot more co-expression networks. So if you if you actually want to treat all the data equally, you probably should do equal by data type. Um, so that's for if, if you don't want to use this automatic uh, weighting option. But if you use automatic uh, weighting, what it does is, uh, for, this, for, for example, biological process space, if you have less than six queries, it's Gmania has been run on um, hundreds of gene ontology annotations to try to use um, information in these networks to predict gene function. And when you do that, you for each function that you're trying to predict, you assign a way to a network. So you can say, on average, networks that are very relevant for predicting biological processes should be given high weight for um, generic queries than networks that are not relevant for predicting biological um, 
um, processes, for example, when you're trying to predict gene ontology annotations. Um, so based on experiments that have been run before, um, networks are, are given a weight that determines how relevant they've been in previous gene function prediction um, tests. Uh, but that's all if you have less than six genes. If you have more than six genes, you can try to use the uh, automatic weighing scheme. And a nice side product that, of that is that if you use that, then you also get this, um, you also figure out which networks were actually used in your, to make your context dependent network. And maybe that becomes of interest to you because you can go and look to see, uh, first of all, you can look to see if the approach actually used the network that you thought would be relevant. For example, the, the expression, the, the example that I brought up about um, brain data and gene expression in brain data. So hopefully, if you had a list of brain genes, Gmania automatically identified brain gene expression data set and used some of those. And that's a, a way to confirm uh, that it's working properly, hopefully. Uh, and the other thing is that you might be su surprised. You uh, it might select some data that uh, actually you might be interested in or want to look into because that data seems to provide a lot of information about your gene set. So I already explained this. Um, OK, and now the last concept that I want to um, talk about is this direct interactions versus label propagation. And this is actually a pretty interesting uh, topic, but I think it's uh, not very well understood. So I'll try to explain it in a clear way. So what, what, I, what we talked about up to now is you have your networks. Uh, and then you have a list of genes that you are interested in. So this is your query gene. and here I'm, uh, I have them colored as red. So uh, you have your network, you have your query genes, and there are two things now you can do. You can look at the direct neighbors of, of these query genes. So here are what you're doing. So you're taking your query genes, you're directly only looking at other genes that are direct, with the direct connections connected to them, <coughs> and you say something like, I think if these were all like involved in some sort of function, I think these two, um, but some a little bit lower confidence, should be involved in that function. You're just looking at direct interaction. But you can, but um, what Gmania and if, a few sophisticated methods do is they use what's called label propagation. So label propagation is a little bit um, more involved than just looking at direct uh, interaction. What it does is that it basically uh, considers the whole graph global structure to use not just direct interaction, but indirect interaction to infer genes that should be relevant. So an example here is that if you were to use label propagation, instead of just cutting off your, you know, your gene set that you see to those that are directly connected, you see um, a, a little bit more farther away genes too. Um, because in practice, what happens is that a lot of times you get, um, you know, you get uh, some, some very dense area of the network here, and then uh, let's say that these were your query genes, and there's a dense uh, area of the network here, those um, genes have an indirect connection to your query genes, but they might be of interest to you because they're tightly connected with many indirect neighbors of your query genes. So label propagation does this by uh, using what's called a label propagation uh, algorithm to score all the genes in the network based on their direct and indirect connection to your um, gene list. And it's, um, and actually has a closed form solution, meaning that it's, um, you can figure out the score of every gene in this network uh, by just one equation. So there's not a lot of parameters to play around with. It's based on graph theory that tells you, depending on how far given node is, um, what its score should be. Um, questions about that? So Gmania, what it, it's doing is using label propagation. It's not using direct, um, just direct neighborhood. And that's why you can get an expanded um, set of genes, some of which are directly connected, some of which are um, indirectly connected. Is this what hot does? Yes. Um, hot sets, I think it uses label propagation. I, I, I read the paper a long time ago, and uh, now I don't remember. But I think it's a very similar concept. You try to basically. So how do you stop the propagation? How do you decide? You don't have to, because it's a um, it's a global algorithm that um, um, so there's ad hoc ways of thinking about it, but there is actually a um, graph theoretic approach that that determines how much propagation you should do. So 
or it's, uh, this algorithm converges, meaning that um, and it, it's, it's a convex algorithm, meaning that there's just one solution to it. And if you had to translate that to an iterative process, what would happen is that for a given node, you take the score of its neighbor, you average that, and that's the score of the current node. You repeat that many, many times until the no score changes in the network anymore. And if you do that, you always end up at the same um, result, no matter, um, yeah, uh, if you started with the same gene set. So starting from a gene set, you always have a global solution that gives that is the optimal for this propagation. So what do you method. optimize? So it's, you said it's complex optimization. So what do you optimize? Um, you have an objective function that um, says that how um, the score of two nodes that are close by should be similar according to their edge weights, and also says that the initial score of a labeled node should be not too different from the label that you had for it. I, I can provide the equation for you later. Yeah, so this is summarizing what I uh, mentioned before. In direct interaction, uh, string them links, um, uh, so you're just looking at direct interaction with your query genes. Um, and uh, an, an example of algorithm of this, this is naive base. In label propagation, you're looking further than just your direct links. And in a lot of situations, this could actually be very beneficial um, because it could be that you're, you know, there are some direct connections that are very sparsely connected to anything else, and you um, kind of don't get a good idea of what's going on in the overall network if you don't look at um, indirect connections as well. So um, here's a, actually this is a slide that I made for my one of my PhD um, uh, part of my PhD uh, thesis to demonstrate how label propagation works. So imagine that you have this kind of really nice network. It's connected to four subcomponents. And imagine that you have um, these four nodes as your initial query. So label propagation, um, what I'm going to show here is the size of the node depends on the score that it received after you ran this label propagation algorithm. So all the genes that were in this subcomponent received a really high node plus some of the genes here because they were connected to this um, gene in the middle. Versus if you were using direct neighbors, uh, you would see something more limited. And actually some of those um, here would not show up because not all the genes are connected to each other. Um, so in summary, I don't know how much time we have. Let's check. Uh, so in summary, um, something like G-mania has um, three parts. There's an automated, um, updated database that kind of contains, hopefully, all sorts of data that people have measured and are available in all sorts of public databases. Um, there is a query algorithm to find um, networks that are relevant to your gene set. And then there is a client network browser that shows you, that displays the, um, the networks that, that you see. So I, I would say the heavy lifting is the collection of all those data sets that exist out there, and then using these algorithms in a fast way to figuring out which networks are relevant to your query. And of course, all of this um, happens in a matter of seconds, even though these are very complicated computation, and that's uh, the power of it. If you were to sit there for, an, you know, for 10 minutes to kind of look at the network, probably you wouldn't end up using it. And so one of the emphasis is try to do all of this in a way that you know you can do it in, in 10 seconds or less. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned some of this before. So there's already a lot of um, kind of curated databases that are already part of Gene Mania. For example, Interpro, um, Interlog, um, Biogrid, Geo, data sets that are coming from all those sources that are part of Gmania, and you can look at the data that's there, and I showed you a little bit how to uh, figure out exactly what's there. In terms of gene identifiers, you can use um, all kind of standard uh, gene identifiers, and you can mix them, and Gmania will automatically try to put them all in one um, identifier. I think the um, go-to is the gene symbol. Um, so, uh, but they're all internally, like if you provide different types of identifier, they're all internally mapped to ensemble, 
and uh, this uh, ensemble, um, the genome identifying based on ensemble is periodically updated. So it might not be, it's not mirrored, so it's not, you know, like up to date with ensemble, but uh, every few months I think yeah, it's um, updated in the database, so it shouldn't be too outdated. So um, what I mentioned to you was the Gmania web browser, but there's also a Cytoscape plugin that you can use. And the Cytoscape plugin is useful if um, you want to basically create similar functionality for other organisms. You want to kind of create your own version of Gmania that you want to use locally. And also if you want to use um, larger gene lists. Uh, so in the browser, probably if your gene lists are larger than 100, you, start to, you will start to get into um, scaling issues and it won't be as fast anymore. <laughs> you might see it crash if the, your gene lists are very large. So if you have large gene lists that you want to investigate, um, better use to use the Cytoscape plugin. And then there's this, um, there was this um, R package, uh, sorry, it was a command line tool that was also published uh, called Query Runner. And this is if you want to use Gmail in a more industrial way. What you can do with this is a, a few interesting things. One is, let's say that you have um, a data set of your own, and you want to compare this data against all the other data that is available in Gmania. How would you compare it? You can compare it in terms of how much information about co-functionality between genes does your data have, and how much does that com or how does that compare to the other databases that are out there to find the, your you know like maybe your data set is uniquely contributing to information about um, gene functions. So you can do this these kind of things with Query Runner, uh, which is a command line tool, and. So I talked about Gmania a lot. I'll also mention String, and I think some of you have already seen or used String. String is a very useful um, kind of network visualization database and gene function prediction tool as well. Um, it's um, the diff I would say the main difference with Gmania is that it's context uh, independent, so it basically doesn't consider your query genes to construct this combined network. It already has a combined network that's constructed. Um, in a static way, but um, it, otherwise it has a lot of this, uh, similar functionality. You can input your gene list, it will give you a network, it will tell you um, which kind of data are supporting those connections, so it has a legend that you can see um, which databases those, um, uh, you can here see, it. so these are the data that are supporting the edges that you see, and it'll give you a lot of information about your genes, and it also does uh, functional enrichment analysis, so you also see um, what functions are enriched in your gene set as um, kind of a side product of visualizing your networks. Uh, so here are a few um, kind of comparisons. Um, String has been um, in existence for a long time now, since 2003. Uh, it has large organism coverage, um, the nodes are proteins, so, so um, they don't include, um, so in Gmania you could have non-coding genes as well, but here the, the nodes are proteins. Um, and also um, the, um, it uses direct interactions and not label propagation, so you only see things that are directly linked to your um, genes of interest. Um, in contrast, Gmania, I mentioned some of this, um, it right now supports nine um, organisms, uh, and you can add more for yourself if you use the Cytoscape plugin. It's gene focused and it has thousands of network. I would say probably the database of network is a lot more comprehensive in terms of um, profiling data that, that exists out there, especially in GEO. Um, it does enrichment analysis and it uses labor propagation, which not only tells you about direct neighbors, but also indirect um, neighbors that might be relevant. Um, and those are all um, that I had, so I'm um, hoping that you were able to take away some useful information about networks, their visualization, and integration of your data with other data sources that exist um, out there, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm.